Well, welcome to church, everyone. So excited that you guys are joining us, wherever you're joining us from today. Uh, like Pastor Bryce just said, my name is Nathan, and I am the discipleship pastor here at Evangel. And I'm really excited to uh, step into this new role and hope I can do it justice. And uh, just want to say that it's such an honor to just serve at this church and to serve underneath Pastor Josh. And uh, honestly, when I, I was presented this role, it was just like to me, it was just like, yeah. That's definitely the job I want to do because it's just who I am. And I love, I love discipleship. I love talking about God and teaching people uh, about Jesus. And I love how Pastor Bryce just said that Jesus, we've heard about him. And he lives up to everything that you've ever have heard about him. And I hope that today as we're talking about Jesus that you would experience that in a powerful way powerful way today. And so we're uh, continuing on with a series called Summer Playlist where we've chosen a variety of different topics, fun topics to talk about such as heaven and fatherhood last week. And uh, we've anchored every one of our sermons uh, to a song, a unique song that echoed the principles that were taught uh, in the message that day. And I actually believe you can find our uh, summer playlist on Spotify. You could also find it on Apple Music. So if you guys are looking for some tunes while you're driving in the car or at work, I want to encourage you to look for that I'd like to actually begin today's message with a story of an individual named Thomas Aquinas. Everybody say Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas. And uh, Thomas Aquinas was a famous theologian in the medieval times. He was actually a philosopher. Uh, the church, throughout church history, uh, it's, very, it's argued that he is the greatest theologian of all times. And he actually wrote something, one of his greatest intellectual achievements uh, of Western civilization called his Summa Theologica. His Summa Theologica, or his Summary of Theology. And what it is, it's this gigantic piece of work. It's uh, volumes and volumes, and it's his whole life study on God. And he, his objective was to put everything he knew into one thing that people could read uh, after he would pass away. And so, on December 6, 1273, Thomas Aquinas all of a sudden completely stopped writing his Summa Theologica. What happened is that he was actually at church, and he was partaking in communion at this moment, and where he received a vision from God, where he looked into a glimpse into eternity and a glimpse into the great the greatness and the grandioseness of who God was. And after he had this vision from God, he just quit writing completely. And one day one of his friends came up to him and he said, Thomas, why did you stop writing your life's work, your Summa Theologica? And he said this famous quote, and that was this, I can write no more. All that I have written is like straws. He looked, he got this vision from God. He saw the greatness of who God was. God's majesty, his grandioseness, his transcendence. And he said, everything that I've ever written, every word that I've ever spoken about God, it pales into comparison to how great God truly is. He said, it's not even worth writing and trying to describe how great God is because he's that great. He's that good that it's not even worth me trying. Thomas Aquinas got something I'm calling a case of the Oz. And uh, I would like to preach a message today called a case of the Oz. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the majesty of God. And even when I was going to uh, preach this sermon, started writing it, I was kind of like, where do I even begin on this? How do I even begin to describe God's greatness. You know, there's kind of this joke on the teaching team here that when it comes to one of these subjects, whether it's circumcision or the majesty of God, Pastor Nate will do it, right? <laughs> 
I'm referencing a sermon from last year. (laughs) But where do I even begin is what I was asking myself. Because you could talk about this subject forever and ever. Because when we're talking about the majesty of God, it's such a wide topic. It's, we're essentially asking the question, what makes God, God? What's the Godness of who God is? And the Bible uses so many different words to describe this. It uses words like God's glory, God's greatness, his splendor, his transcendence, God's power. All of these are examples of the majesty of God. But today I want to just take some time to give you three straws to think about in the words of, or in the language of a Thomas Aquinas. Three straws to think about when we talk about God's majesty, and that's this. That God is bigger than you can imagine. He's more beautiful than you could desire and closer than you could ever hope for. God is bigger than you can imagine. He's more beautiful than you could desire and closer than you could have ever hoped for. First off, he's bigger than you could ever imagine. Psalm 8.1 says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. They're beyond the heavens. And when the Bible uses the word heavens, oftentimes what it means is outer space. Okay? That's, it's beyond. It's above. It's greater. I remember when I was 12 years old, I was uh, sitting at my table one day, and all of a sudden, somebody came and knocked at the door. And it was actually some people that were going like door to door trying to share the gospel. And so we invited them into our house. And we sat at the table and we started talking about God. And I started asking all those questions that make your head hurt, you know. Like, well, where did God begin? Like, who created God? Like, God can't die? How is that possible? And I started asking these these questions that really are about the infinity of who God was. And when we talk about the majesty of God, the infinity of God is the backdrop of his majesty. It's the fact that God is bigger than all that we know, that he's on top of the food chain. You know that question, like, who made God? Well, anytime you ask that question, if something made God, guess what that makes that? God. And so God has to be at the top of the food chain. And so... That's what, that's what makes God so majestic because he's so big. He's so much beyond, so much greater than anything that I could imagine. You know, I wouldn't be that impressed if God was four feet tall, right? But I'm impressed when I stand in front of Mount Rushmore and I see how big it is. Or when I stand in, fa- in front of Mount Everest and I see how big it is in comparison to me. It's when I look at the stars at night. And I see the distance from me to them. And it blows my mind. And it gives me a case of the awes in those moments. And you see, the writers of scripture believe that God was bigger than you could ever imagine. Let's just take a second to look at how they thought of God. You know, they probably wouldn't use this type of language. But they believed that God was outside. He was transcendent. That he was outside of time. He was outside of space. He was outside of matter. And we know this from the very first verse of the Bible. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God was before the beginning. When God created things, God was there before the beginning. And when he created, he created time. He created space. He created matter. He created the earth and the heavens and the space in which they they would sit in. And so God is outside of our reality. He's outside of our experience. He transcends everything that we know. And this means that God is eternal. God right now can be at the beginning of creation because he's outside of time. At the same time as being at the cross and also at the return of Jesus. And this is why God knows everything, because he's at all moments of time. And this is why, as a Christian, I can trust that God knows what's coming ahead for me. And this is why, as a Christian, that I can trust that God can change the trajectory of my life when I pray to him, that he knows that things can change, and he can uh, put put a roadblock in my story, and he can put roadblocks into your story to protect you. 
because God transcends our reality. We also know that he's eternal. Psalm 92 says this, before the mountains were brought forth, or you ever formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's always existed. He'll never cease to exist. And if God would cease to exist, our reality would just implode upon itself. It, it's contingent on God's existence. The writers of scripture also believed he spoke everything out of nothing. This is actually a Christian doctrine. It's called ex nihilo. And what it means, it means out of nothing. And God spoke everything, not creating, not, out, not making the world out of himself, but he just spoke and things began to occur. It's as if he spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. Genesis 1, 3 says this, let there be light. And guess what happened? Light happened. And all throughout Genesis chapter 1, you'll see God say, let there be space beneath the waters. Let the waters beneath. Let the land sprout with vegetation. Let lights appear in the sky. Let them be signs to mark the seasons. Every time God said, let there be something, something occurred. And it's as if all nature and science follows the sound of his voice. Did you know that the Bible also says this, that he breathes out stars? He can breathe out a star. Psalm 33, 6 says this, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. You know why this is important though? Because if God is greater than anything or bigger than anything that I could ever imagine, he's bigger than anything that I could ever face. He's bigger than the cancer that you might be struggling with. He's bigger than the financial issues that you might be facing. He's bigger than a marriage that's falling apart. He's bigger than anything you could ever go through. He's bigger than COVID-19. And as a Christian, I trust that God is bigger and there's nothing that I can go through, nothing that I could ever face that I can't trust God with in those moments. Do you have a case of the Oz. Not only is he bigger than anything you could ever imagine, he's also more beautiful than you could desire. See, Christianity believes that our whole world declares the glory and the beauty of God. This is a photo of a good friend of mine, me and her. This is my dog, Pippa, okay? <laughs> And I love this dog so much. <laughs> and yeah, she doesn't look like she likes me in this photo. But <laughs> Pippa, every morning when I wake up, she comes up to me and she's wagging her tail. And actually her whole butt's moving back and forth. And I always pet, go down and I pet her. I go, oh, Pippa, you declare the glory of God. That's what I tell her every morning. <laughs> and the reason why I tell her that is this. It's because she does. She declares the glory and the beauty of God. God. See, not everything that's beautiful is majestic, but everything that's majestic is beautiful. To be ugly and to be majestic, that's like an oxymoron. That cannot happen. But great and beautiful things have majesty, and the God of Christianity has both of these. And we see his beauty through his created world. When I go outside, I can see the beauty of God. A few years ago, I got married. We're on our third year. And uh, we, for our honeymoon, went to Hawaii. It was the first time I've ever been to Hawaii. But I was blown away while I was there. Because I got to see all, this whole other aspect of the world. And I got to see this beauty of who God was while I was there. We would, we like, well, this day I didn't really like. We climbed this mountain one day. <laughs> Super tired. <laughs> and I remember looking out. And seeing all these different mountains and the vegetation that was on it. And looking at the oceans that roar his greatness. And I was captivated. I was blown away by it. We went snorkeling a different day. And we rode on this boat. And when we got to, when we got to the place, we got to see turtles. And we got to see all these cool fishes in the sea. But on the way there, 
we actually got to see humpback whales. They started literally 20 feet in front of me, started jumping out of the water, just like this. This was 20 feet in front of me. I saw three of them do this. And I was blown away. I had a case of the Oz in this moment. You know, humpback whales, they can be 60 feet long, they weigh up to 40 tons. Their flippers are 13 feet long. And the Bible says that humpback whales and the fishes of the sea declare the glory of God. Psalm 148, 7 says this, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, that even the ocean, like I said earlier, it roars his greatness. And every creature in the sea declares the beauty and the majesty of who God is. Is But not only do humpback whales do, but elephants do as well. And every creature in the world. See, elephants are the largest land animal that are out there. They eat like 330 pounds of food every single day. And God made that. And you know, every time that elephant does something when it takes a step or when it toots its trunk. It's declaring the beauty and the glory of God. And it captivates me every time I think of this. It's as if I can see his heart in everything he's ever made. You see, there's 8.7 million different species of creatures on this earth that display the beauty of God. 8.7 million. Creatures that have caught his breath. But it's not just creatures that declare his glory. It's our world. It's the sky that does. The other day I was driving home from my in-laws. And this wasn't that photo that day. But I saw the sky and I was, I thought, wow, it's so beautiful. Every day I get to wake up. I get to go outside. And I get to look at the sky. And then I go to work, and I come home, and guess what? The sky's changed. It looks different. And it's as if I get to see a different canvas of God's grace every day in different ways. See, Psalm 19.1 says this, that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims his handiwork or his craftsmanship. That even the sky itself shows the beauty of God. This is, next photo is a picture of a volcano that's in India. I picked this volcano, it's called Kawa Ijin, and uh, the reason why I picked this is because it has blue lava, okay, <laughs> and it's actually sulfuric acid that makes the lava look blue, and so you can go and visit this, but just because it's blue, you shouldn't jump in it, it's not cool, okay, <laughs> but the Bible says that the landscape declares God's glory. Psalm 148.9 says the mountains and all the hills and every volcano declares the beauty of God. You ever go out, go out stargazing at night? I love looking at the stars. The Bible says that the stars declare God's glory. And you know when God began to speak and he breathed out stars, it's as if he made 100 billion galaxies. And the human eye is only capable of seeing 5,000 of them at once. And every time you look at a star, you're actually looking into the past. And it gives me a case of the Oz when I do that. And I think about our own sun, which is powerful. It's 109 times wider than the earth. Literally like a million earths could fit inside this thing. And it's a burning star. A signal fire of God's grace. And it provides heat for us. It takes care of our world. And it's as if God had this here for a reason for us. You see, we also believe that by the vapor of his breath, the planets were formed. This is the next photo is us. This is earth. You're in this photo. 
Now, I was going to get like Saturn and all these other planets, but I realized people aren't up there on Instagram, so there's not a lot of options, okay? <laughs> but this is our home. And I love when I think about the earth and I think about its specifics. It's the right distance from the sun to sustain life. It has the exact amount of nitrogen to oxygen levels to sustain life. It's gravitational pull. It's so specific. And it's as if there's a creator saying to this world that I love you and I'm taking care of you. God's prized creation, though, is humanity, though. These are photos of people in our own church. And the Bible says that we are God's master's piece. That you bear something called the Imago Dei in Genesis 126 and 27. There's something unique about you. And you declare the beauty of God. When you look at the person to your left and right, they declare God's beauty. And every person is a precious child that he died to save. Do you have a case of the Oz yet? You see, this matters because how you treat creation shows your reverence for the creator. And it, this should impact the way that we live our lives. Next time there's that fly that's bothering you, think twice before you kill it. <laughs> when you go out hunting... I'm not saying it's wrong to hunt, but if you kill just to kill, it should impact the way that you hunt. You should want to do a clean kill, not let an animal suffer. It should impact the way that you treat each other. Whatever color skin you are, red, yellow, black, and white, everybody is precious in his sight. Every person declares the glory of God. And when you look at someone, you can see their beauty. If you just give them enough time, you'll see the beauty of God. But it also should impact the way you view yourself. You might be here today and maybe you don't think you're beautiful. And maybe someone has told you something that's not true. You know that phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? That's not true. Beauty is in the eyes of the creator. Because the book of Genesis, that every time God created something, it says that it is good. And in Genesis 131, he said it is very good. So next time you look in the mirror and you question whether or not you look good, you say, no, I look good. And then you say, I actually look very good. <laughs> but it should impact the way that you treat other people. He's also closer than you could have ever hoped for. You see, the first two points that I made tonight, most of the world's religions would agree with. That God is greater than we could ever imagine. He's more beautiful than you could ever desire. But this one, to throw this one in the equation, this is where world religions will actually struggle with. Because it's either God is out there, he's greater than everything, that we can't reach him. So we can't be in a personal relationship with him. Or world religions have gone the other way where, hey, you can know gods, but they're not that powerful. Greek mythology, you would see this. That you can actually know the gods, but they die. Only Christianity believes that God is greater than you could ever imagine. And closer than you could have ever hoped for. See, the whole world has been looking for this person that transcends time. That transcends our reality, space and matter. And they've asked this question, how can I know him? If he's beyond me. If he's out there. John 1, 1 says this. Echoing Genesis 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Skip down to verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from, from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was spoken into our reality. He came into the world that he created. This God that was out there that we could not get to. He came to us. That's what we believe. He's closer than we could have ever hoped for. And his majesty we see in the person of Jesus Christ. 
We see how much he loves people. And we see how powerful he was. He came to this world and he began to control creation. It's as if he began to heal creation. There was a moment that he calmed the seas. He walked on water. He began to multiply food. Took some bread, made it more bread. Turned water into wine. He would begin to heal people of their diseases. And he showed that he had power over the created world. He brought the dead back to life. But not only that, he began to speak. And it's as if he made a hundred billion failures disappear. He'd walk up to people individually. And he said, pick up your mat and walk. Your sins are forgiven. And everybody was astounded. He went up to a woman. He said, hey, who accuses you of your sin? And she said, no one. He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. And he began to wipe away people's failures, every one of their sins. Doesn't that sound amazing? Do you want your failures to be disappeared? And then he did something. He paid the penalty of sin for every person. He died on a hill that he created, a tree that he designed for a world that he loves to free it from the curse of sin. And I love this, God, because he's closer than you could have ever hoped for. And the Bible says, this God that's out there, he knows you. Every one of you. He knows you. He knows the number of hairs on your head, the Bible says. You say, well, I don't have hair. That's okay. <laughs> He knows when you sit and when you stand, the Bible says. He knows your every thought. Literally, there's where can I go to escape him, the Bible says. Everywhere I go, he's there. He knows you by name, even. You want to know how he knows you by name? Because if you've ever started reading the Bible, you'll come across something. It's called a genealogy list. And those are the chapters of the Bible where all like, <laughs> let's skip those couple pages. Because you read those names and you know what you think? What significance does this have? The, this person, who's the son of this person, who's the father of this person? Who are they? What do they matter? Have you ever thought of that about yourself? Do I matter? And if God knows their name and he put them in a book, he knows your name. And guess what? He's going to write it in a book called the book of life. He knows you by name. He's greater and bigger than you could ever imagine. He's more beautiful than you could have ever desired. And he's closer than you could have ever hoped for. The creator of the universe, of the galaxies, of the world, of every creature desires to encounter you today. Wherever you're joining us from. He desires to know, for you to know him. Do you have a case of the Oz. We're gonna sing a song called So Will I. It's one of my favorite, it is my favorite song. So I was super excited that I got this topic. But what I wanna do is give you an opportunity to respond to the creator of the universe. And maybe you've never given your life to Jesus or maybe you've had failures that need to be disappeared. I want you to take this moment to sit and reflect on the song I'm going to come up here in a few short moments to give you that opportunity. Do you have a case of the Oz? God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planet's form. If 
The stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see you hard in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation stings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, a syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, of nature and science, follow the sound of your voice. Catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you say. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every pain is sky, a canvas of your grace. Creation still obeys you so 